Farmers and ranchers have always adjusted to changing economic and environmental demands. Today's demands are challenging them with a new set of problems. Problems stemming from development of neighboring land, oversupply of nutrients, and the loss of farm chemicals. A growing number of farmers and ranchers are adjusting to these problems with the help of an old practice, composting. For food safety concerns, we decided it would be better to go to compost than manure. But composting is not just about problems, it also offers opportunities. Opportunities to lower production costs, add revenue, and rebuild soil productivity. In my opinion, the use of compost in agriculture is probably one of the most untapped opportunities in America today. Because of the problems it solves and the opportunities it creates, composting is a useful tool for sustainable agriculture. Greetings and welcome to Compost, a resource for Western agriculture. I'm Eric Anderson, your moderator for today's programs. One of the most exciting trends in the compost industry is the growing appreciation for compost among farmers. Farm users of compost range from small U-pick operations to large farms managing tens of thousands of acres. A wide variety of crops are grown with compost, such as small fruits, vegetables, sugar beets, potatoes, grains, seed crops, hay, and nursery plants. Yet many farmers and agricultural professionals remain uncertain about the benefits and use of compost. In today's program, we hope to remove much of that uncertainty. Our goal is to provide you an understanding of the real and potential value of compost to agricultural production and to the environment. This workshop is part of a larger project known by the acronym CERWA, C-E-R-W-A, which stands for Compost Education and Resources for Western Agriculture. CERWA is a regional education project funded by the Western Region Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program of the USDA. CERWA includes several educational products, such as a newsletter, slide sets, and an internet course. You can find out more about CERWA by visiting the project website. The CERWA website address is www.aste.usu.edu slash compost. The core of the CERWA project is a series of satellite workshops about agricultural composting and compost use. Today's workshop is the second program in the series. The first workshop was broadcast on November 5, 1998, and covered agricultural composting. Today, we will deal with the use of the product of composting, compost. As before, your local workshop site is part of a network of sites across the West and beyond that are viewing this program. We hope that you have opportunities at your site to build on this program with some locally relevant presentations and discussions. In today's program, we will attempt to answer many of the questions that agricultural producers might ask when considering whether or not to use compost. Our presentation includes video segments where producers describe their experiences using compost. We'll hear from researchers and compost experts about when and where compost should be used in agriculture and what type of compost should be used. And we'll have question and answer sessions with compost specialist here in the studio, as well as with others who will be joining us by telephone. Now, in the limited time that we have today, we hope to leave you with a better understanding of the role of compost in agriculture. However, we do not expect to cover all compost questions. There may be some important questions that you have that are not addressed, and we want to try to answer your questions. So get a, pe a pencil and paper ready so you can take down the phone numbers where you can submit your questions to us. You may, uh, we encourage you to call, fax, or email your questions to us at any time during the broadcast. Our panel of experts will tackle them later on in the program. The phone number is 
800-390-7551. Again, that's 800-390-7551. Our fax number is 800-803-5998. Again, 800-803-5998. You can also reach us via email at a special address we have set up, which is serwa, C-E-R-W-A, at U-I-D-A-H-O dot E-D-U. We'd like to begin today by examining the value of compost. Our first presentation is by David Granitstein, Extension Specialist with the Washington State University Center for Sustaining Agriculture and Natural Resources. In this segment, David examines what compost is and describes its general uses. Just as the process of composting remains a combination of science and art, the end product is a mix of well-defined properties and more complex and subtle attributes. All compost is a stabilized organic matter material resulting from the controlled decomposition of organic raw materials. The composition will depend largely upon the initial feedstocks and to a lesser extent on the composting process and management used. There are various ways to learn what your compost is made of. You can conduct different physical, chemical, and biological tests. Some type of testing is recommended to better match the product with the end use for the compost. Analysis ranges from simple sensory evaluation, such as the look, feel, and smell of the compost, to routine laboratory testing, looking at standard nutrient analysis, to highly sophisticated tests, such as nuclear magnetic resonance. With any compost product, there are a number of potential benefits and several potential drawbacks to consider. I have loosely divided the benefits into those more related to soil quality and environmental aspects and those more related to crop production. The organic matter contribution of compost is the key benefit to soils and environment. Organic matter improves soil structure, increases water infiltration, and enhances the nutrient holding ability of soil by increasing cation exchange capacity. Compost acts as a food source for many soil organisms, stimulating the biological component. Compost applications have successfully reduced soil erosion, nutrient leaching, and surface runoff, leading to improved environmental quality. Many of these benefits provide values to the farm that are hard to quantify in terms of dollars, but still are important. For crop production, Compost contains a broad range of both macro and micronutrients that can enhance crop nutrition. Some nutrients are in a slow-release form that remain available to the crop throughout the growing season. Compost can measurably increase the moisture holding capacity of soil, reducing drought stress and lowering irrigation needs. Compared to the raw materials, compost contains fewer wheat seeds, pathogens, and odors, providing real economic benefits. And ongoing research is showing the potential for compost to control various soil-borne diseases. A primary concern with compost use is lack of consistency relative to commercial fertilizer. The product can vary from batch to batch and among different types. An immature compost contains phytotoxic compounds that can injure plants. Compost can contain various contaminants such as heavy metals and foreign particles. In addition, there's no guarantee that compost will be pathogen-free. The end use will dictate what level of contaminant is acceptable. In the arid regions of the West, the high salt content of some composts can be a problem. High levels can damage or kill plants even at modest application rates. The slow release nature of some nutrients in compost makes it more difficult to accurately predict availability to the crop. And compost can be an expensive purchase, one with an uncertain probability of a payback. Sometimes the benefits from compost are clearly evident. For example, the field of canola shown here was grown after a barley crop that had received strips of compost. The low spots in the canola represent the untreated areas, while the better growth is where compost was applied. The effects on crops, especially perennials, may be more subtle, as in the case of apple trees. The compost mulch applied to the trees in this orchard stabilized the soil moisture content but did not result in measurable improvements in tree growth. 
Much of the field research on compost is inconsistent. For example, in this study of compost on potatoes in Idaho, soil organic matter levels were clearly increased by the high rates of compost. But the yield results showed no trend of improvement with compost applications. So you need to balance short-term payoff with longer-term benefits when evaluating compost use in agriculture. One way to look at the value of compost is to calculate the nutrient content and assign dollar values based on commercial fertilizer. Using this approach, the two composts illustrated here contain more dollars of total nutrients than the cost. But since the nutrients will be available over several seasons, only some portion of the dollar value can be charged to the current season. However, a big economic constraint for compost use is hauling and handling costs. Freight costs for bringing in compost in my area can exceed the original cost of the compost. Moisture content is a key factor in freight and compost value. Compost can be a cost-effective source of nitrogen for organic farmers when compared to other sources of N, but the cost per pound of N varies greatly among compost products. Compost is a great resource for agriculture. To realize its value, consider the following steps. Know your end use and expectations. Look for the products that match it. Look at the relative value of the products and consider both the short-term and long-term benefits of compost application. As you can see, compost offers a variety of potential benefits, from better soil to a better environment. But are these benefits enough for individual farmers? To help us better understand what motivates farmers to use compost, we visited with several users and asked them to describe their reasons for using compost. We're at the tip of the iceberg right now as to how many different ways we can use compost and really, in general, organic fertilizers because I believe that um, there's a need to get away a little bit anyway from the, the high levels of synthetic fertilizers that we've been using historically. Why should you consider using compost? The reasons given by compost users are as diverse as the potential benefits compost provides. For some growers, compost provides a safer or pest-free alternative to manure as a source of crop nutrients and soil organic matter. We switched from manure to compost uh, because it, it appeared to be cost effective and uh, the promise of, of fewer weed seeds in the material. Compost has been an advantage to us in, in that um, it, um, it is ready to go any time. Uh, the problem we've had with manure in the past is, is that you can only apply it at certain times when, when trucks are available or when the fields are are harvested and stuff. You still have to wait for harvest, of course, with the compost, but it, generally they have a good stockpile. Uh, the other advantage to compost is that we aren't comp compacting the soil near as much because uh, they, can, they can travel at 30-foot intervals instead of the manure trucks travel right next to their last pass. Our main reason for going to compost was to move away from manure. We were on a, a heavy manure program uh, on all our ranches and for food safety concerns we decided it would be better to go to compost than manure. We've uh, instituted a HACCP program um, through our salad plant which extends back to our growing and that includes not having uh, raw manure near or on the crops. Um, it includes using uh, the, tr the certified compost in place of the manure. Many growers rely on compost chiefly to improve the soil, soil fertility, biology, or tilth. Compost is a key input for many organic farmers. Organic farmers use compost because, just uh, as I just said, they, they're, they're deeply committed to maintaining soil quality and to sponsoring uh, biological diversity in the soil. In fact, they rely on that biological diversity to protect their crops from diseases. Because I'm farming organically, I want, um, compost is one of the back, backbones for the fertility program for organic farmers. And um, I really uh, am interested in, uh, in improving the uh, you know, microflora, the biological uh, life in the soil. And I think compost is probably, compost and cover crops are the two keys to doing that. 
conventional crop producers are also discovering the advantages of compost, in some cases after they initially use it in their organically managed fields. The uh, reasons we're using compost in organic division are both for um, fertility reasons and for building soil. For the uh, conventional side of things, we're using compost. Majority of the reason is for building the soil and trying to solve some uh, water penetration problems or holding capacity type problems. We've had some instances where we had poor germination, uh, or not germination, but poor emergence, and we're trying to see if some of that information that we've gained on compost uh, applied in the conventional side will help build those soils up where it'll be easier penetration for water and, and eliminate some of the crusting that we sometimes get in our area for uh, emergence. I guess we started composting because we have a lot of inconsistencies in the field. And um, um, when you go through and harvest a field mechanically or, or manually, um, a lot of that produce from the whole pass goes into the same trailer. And so if you could go out and fix your, your bad spots, you can really lower your, your costs of sorting and packaging. Compost is also used to replace farm chemicals or overcome their negative effects. The reasons that we started with compost, composting was uh, several years ago, or two or three years ago, we uh, started using Vapam and researching Vapam and looking at some of the aspects of Vapam, we kind of thought maybe along with some of the positive effects of Vapam, we were going to maybe incur some negative uh, uh, aspects of using Vapam, and we thought maybe one of the ways to overcome that would be to apply compost. Uh, we started using compost because as a, a grower of plants, we have a tremendous amount of uh, waste material that we generate every year. Here at this site in Oregon, we generate about 20,000 uh, cubic yards of waste, and uh, to dispose of that uh, could become a, a big problem. So about five years ago, we started uh, grinding our waste plant material, and uh, we would uh, then use that in our soil uh, mix that we use in our uh, containers. One of the main benefits of, of using the active compost instead of just using the raw ground material is that uh, we're able to use the heat of composting to eliminate any uh, pests or diseases that might be in that uh, compost instead of having to use methyl bromide and we've been able to reduce our methyl bromide use by about 40 percent. Use of compost is often encouraged because it can be beneficial to the environment. As David Granitstein explained, compost can help conserve water and nutrients and reduce erosion. Reducing environmental impacts in agriculture is important, but is it reason enough to justify the use of compost? To help us answer this question, we have called on Arnold King of the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service. Arnold is the National Technology Coordinator for the NRCS Ecological Services Division. He is joining us today by telephone from Fort Worth, Texas. Hello, Arnold. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Arnold, uh, we're interested to know, does the NRCS consider the use of compost to be beneficial for natural resources? Uh, very definitely. Uh, we could make a long list of the benefits of composting. Uh, thinking about it, I just uh, have three here that I'll mention quickly. Uh, first and, and foremost, I guess from our viewpoint, is safe disposal, <coughs> safe disposal of otherwise material that would just be waste material. And I think that's an obvious benefit that will become more and more important over time. And the fact that it can be safely applied at almost any rate is certainly a plus. So that makes it well suited for homeowners and uh, nurserymen and uh, not to mention farmers and ranchers and others uh, who could use that material if the material was available. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> maintaining soil quality is a very important resource concern in USDA and compost is, uh, we think, is the ultimate soil amendment and there's very few negatives, if any, uh, towards uh, uh, applying compost to soil. Probably the only negative is the cost of producing material and uh, maybe lack of uh, supplies for agriculture use. And <clears throat> thirdly, a healthy soil absorbs and, absorbs and holds more water, as I've heard stated here previously, 
And when you have that situation, it cuts down quite a bit on uh, erosion and makes soil uh, less erodible. So those are th three things that I would mention there. Okay, great. Do you think that the use of compost by itself will become recognized as a conservation practice? Uh, it can be. Uh, I don't think anyone's made a move towards making it a standalone conservation practice. Uh, it could be that way, or it can be covered as a component to our existing waste utilization practice that we've had in our field office tech guide for many years. So it's just kind of the demand. If there's a demand for that practice as a standalone practice, it can certainly be set up that way. Do you think that as more and more producers are using compost, that there, there will be then developments such as uh, even considering covering the purchase of compost through a cost-sharing program? Uh, it very well could be. I, I think we need uh, all the incentives we can possibly get to uh, encourage people to not only produce compost but also to use compost. Uh, now, if it's set up as an official NRCS practice, it can be cost-shared. Uh, as well as, well, I might just say any of the NRCS practices can be cost shared depending on the program reg regulations, and that's not a, not a problem to, to alter the regulations to pick up uh, composting. Uh, <clears throat> getting it established as a practice involves mainly just convincing our uh, National Field Office Tech Guide Committee at, at National Headquarters that we need that practice, and then just doing the paperwork to get it done. There's no uh, reason why it can't be done if the need's there. So uh, I would encourage people who have strong feelings about composting, uh, contact our national office about that. Great. Well, thank you, Arnold, uh, for joining us today and for giving us a perspective from the NRCS about, the use, about the use of compost for conservation. Thank you again. Yes, sir. Improving the environment is one of the many benefits that users expect to receive from compost, but what are farmers actually finding as a result of their compost use? Are these expected and desired benefits coming about? As you'll see in our next video, growers report a wide range of observations and experiences from the use of compost. And their experiences are both positive and negative. While many users have found variable results in the short term, they expect compost to pay off in the long run. Still others are convinced that compost is already working for them. Well, I would say after 20 years of, of farming experience, growing table grapes and other permanent crops, that of all of the various things that we've tried to improve our product and to uh, improve our yields, the quality, please our customers, which is what it's all about, that composting and the use of compost in the field and nutrient management using compost as that foundation is by far the most effective thing that we've done. Most growers who use compost in place of manure have found equivalent agronomic effects, some benefits and some trade-offs. I think our soil quality has, has a, uh, it is in real good shape. It, I think it has improved over the years. This farm particularly, we've had a long history of manure applications and, most, and more recently compost. Um, our organic matter is, is particularly high for this area. It's, um, it'll run two and a half to three percent. The, the normal is one or less for, for a, a lot of these farms in this area. And, and, and I, I think just that much on organic matter in there gives you a real good buffer as far as fertility. It, it releases nitrogen over time. And, and um, the other thing that I've noticed with manure and compost both is um, our phosphorus and potassium level levels uh, both remain at, at a nice high rate and, uh, and, and the soil test has, has borne that out. Although compost is more costly to purchase, it is safer and easier to use. Don Cranford produces compost for California vegetable producer Tanamura and Antel to meet the company's hazard elimination or HACCP program for food safety. We have uh, a HACCP program that was put together to sell the produce that TNA grows that uh, requires a good, clean, stable material to make the buyers happy. And we've shown with, through our, our testing and what we do that we're uh, E. coli pathogen free. Uh, we've, we've tested, we started out with the raw materials coming in with an E. coli of over 23,000, most probable number per gram. And after we finish the process, we have less than three. So the, the compost itself, maybe adding uh, 
to the soil structure. It's certainly adding more organic matter to the ground, uh, but it, I don't believe it adds the same nutritive value that the manure did. Um, but uh, it does have the, the distinction of, of being uh, not only disease-free, but weed-free. Uh, we avoid the, those kinds of problems, not only in, in uh, <coughs> food safety, but in keeping our grounds clean of, of weeds and disease. The results most frequently reported by compost users are changes to the soil, such as higher organic matter, more active biology, improved water holding, and better soil structure. Often these improvements are not attributed to compost alone, but a system of sustainable practices, which include the use of compost. We're increasing our organic matter substantially. We went in the first year on just kind of our rough rough tests, we pulled soil samples and sent them to the lab and we went from about 0.75 to 0.8 percent organic matter in some instances where the soil was a little heavier naturally up to 2 percent in one year and um, in most of the other places it went up to about a percent and a quarter to one and a half and we're gaining on that yearly. We find that the compost is a good bulk filler material. Uh, we believe that there may also be some additional benefits that we see from using the compost in terms of uh, supplying extra nutrients, uh, also providing a better uh, biological environment for the, the roots to grow in. Just over the last three years, we felt like that our yields have improved. Uh, our water uptake is, is a lot better, maybe even to the point where we might be gaining uh, uh, one or two irrigations a year. Uh, the other thing we've noticed, uh, without scientific proof, we just feel like that our ground in the spring and in windy situations is not moving as readily as it used to. The question is whether, whether we've uh, noticed a difference in aeration and water holding capacity. Uh, I would have to add the next one is organic matter levels. And we are on a program where we sample uh, every other year. We're sampling our soils. It appears that we've now raised our organic levels by at least 1% almost all the way across the vineyard. And this is real good. This is really making a, a marked impact. Um, it, uh, the actual penetration of water uh, on February 4th when we had that tremendous rain that come through the valley here. Uh, it was amazing that the following day you could walk out in this vineyard land without rubber boots on and walk through the uh, in the cover cropping area and it basically was just like walking on the carpet in your house. The mud didn't stick to your feet. We're making changes through the amendment program. We're making changes where the, the, the stickiness of the magnesium is not impacting us as much. We're getting greater aeration. I think that uh, the overall program of uh, cover crop and compost and, uh, and the mulch applications have had a marked effect in improving the, the uh, texture of our soils. Effects on yields and crop quality are not as evident. Still, most compost users believe that better soil will lead to better crop quality and yields. During harvest time, Jack came out and asked if I had done a sugar test on the, uh, the apples, and I told him that we were just processing them, so I wasn't overly concerned about sugar and so forth. So we went ahead and did one. We went across the driveway, which is behind us here, and, and tested some that, of the untreated area, and we were running 12, 14, 16 bricks, 17 bricks. Um, and then we came across the driveway on the treated area, and we were running 22 to 27 bricks. What we've seen with uh, crop yield and quality results are uh, between a 10 and 15 percent increase in yield on sugar beets. Um, we've had one grower that netted out at $100 an acre and that was after paying for the compost on sugar beets. Um, barley, we've seen up to 20 to 30 percent yield increases. Alfalfa, we've seen uh, one and a half to two percent increase in protein and a decrease in acid, acid detergent fiber. Although growers' experiences with compost are generally positive, poor results can also occur. There's, there's years that, you know, you can see a night and day difference, but there's years that, that there's also a night and day difference and it's not, and it's not favorable. 
you know, I mean, you see good good results one year and bad results another, and and I don't think we've got her figured out yet. Well, I guess one example of a bad result would be uh, when we initially started playing around with compost. We um, we we put uh, a shovel full of compost in an 18 inch, 12 foot, 12 inch deep hole where we're replanting grape plants. And uh, that year I probably planted 500 grape plants and they all died. So I'm not sure what it was attributed to, but um, um, definitely a bad result. To help provide us with further details about the results that compost is bringing to farms, we now have Ralph Jurgens of New Era Farm Service with us by phone from Santa Clara, California, which also happens to be one of our local workshop sites. Ralph is an agronomist and plant nutrition consultant. He advises many growers in California and elsewhere about the use of compost in crop production systems. Hello, Ralph. Thank you for being How with us you? today. Okay, hello, Ralph, are you uh, there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Okay. Great. Thanks for being with us today. Good morning, Eric. Uh, uh, first question I'd like to ask you is, uh, at the end of the video clip we just saw, the farmer told us that his grape plants had died from the use of compost. I was wondering if you might be able to help us speculate about what happened there. Yes, you know, compost is a process, and it depends on the type of uh, substrate that uh, is, is going through this composting process and the end result. But sometimes we see the accumulation of salts uh, uh, in some types of substrates. And when you put it directly in a hole, the young plant can't survive because of the, the, the salts. And so you have a tendency to have a burn, and, and uh, it's not good. If, you, if, if the, that particular grower would have did a 25% blend of compost with a 75% soil matrix, then it would probably have been just fine. So it was probably a situation of just too much compost added at that particular time. Yeah, we've seen this in the past, not so much vines, but uh, about 20 years ago when we were first starting, we seen it with uh, some young trees the same way. When we investigated, it was the salt concentration. Okay. Ralph, can you give us some insight into why your clients use compost and, and maybe tell us about the types of things that they expect to receive from it? Well, our, our clients are range from anywhere from conventional to uh, sustainable to organic, and, and we have a large range of clientele. But... Primarily, all of them are coming to us for using compost as a need for water infiltration, better soil tilth, and better nutrient utilization, primarily in phosphate and, and potassium utilization. And then, of course, as you move into sustainable farming and the organic farmers, they're much more in tune to the biological awareness and, and the importance of compost as inoculator. So that's, that's why they're using uh, our type of compost. Okay. Well, we're certainly interested in hearing about the results that your clients have found, too, uh, from their compost use. Uh, I guess we certainly want to hear the positive results, but we'd also be interested in hearing any other additional negative results that may have occurred. Yeah, there, there's positive as well as negative. Some of the negative results, again, as mentioned earlier, is the, the process itself and, and uh, some of the lingering problems it may have. Uh, the uh, pathogen reduction, and if it's not composted right, uh, uh, you may be some lingering pathogens, and, and the downside as well as, as uh, 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 weed seeds. Uh, the positive side, of course, most of our growers are using it because it is a stable humus. They're having very good results in water infiltration, which means money, means savings in water. Also, nutrient utilization, what also means savings of, of nutrients, primarily P and K. Uh, our, our type of manure is a dairy manure base. It's fairly high in phosphate and potash. So by using two to three ton per acre, they're able to eliminate their potassium applications and phosphate for most, most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. So we base everything on analytical data. Then we custom blend that because we want the, the compost to perform in the field and in the, the biological influences as well. Well, certainly many of us know that, that California is often a trendsetter in terms of uh, agriculture production. I, I guess I'd just be curious to know your vision of, of compost use in the state. Do you see uh, 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 opportunities for a large expansion of compost use? Yes. Uh, you know, this is our 25th year in the, in the composting end of it. Uh, we are currently working with 780 growers in the state of California. And of that 780, there's 250,000 acres of it that's using sustainable farming practices. 
of those 780 growers, they actually farm a million acres. And these are large-scale farmers uh, using different systems, whether it's transitional or whether it's organic small blocks or using the conventional systems. They're looking at compost and different types of sustainable systems. And it is on the growth, and it is a, it is a viable uh, industry as long as it's done properly. Well, very good. Thank you for being with us today, Ralph. Uh, thank you very much. Now, many of the examples we've seen and heard about the benefits of compost use represent individual operate, uh, observations and experiences. It can be difficult to generalize these findings to other settings, but that's where research comes in. But are researchers finding the same results as the compost users? Well, the answer is yes and no. Research projects have been conducted that are designed to explore the effects of compost on crop production. However, because of the numerous variables involved in growing crops and using compost, many researchers remain unconvinced about the benefits of compost. In general, while the research results have been positive, they have also been inconsistent. In other words, the findings are inconclusive. In this next video, we look at four compost research projects that are being conducted in the Western region. I think that we need to learn a lot more about compost use. Um, and I think for me, as, a, as an advisor of, of growers that are up against the wall on, on making a profit in any given season, the biggest issue is the nutrient delivery capabilities of the compost. Dale Westerman with the USDA ARS in Kimberly, Idaho, is leading a multi-year compost research project in cooperation with the University of Idaho. The project looks at the effects of dairy manure compost on a typical Idaho crop rotation. Overall, results have shown improved crop quality and higher yields due to compost applications. The best treatment in the potatoes was uh, two and a half tons of compost with a nitrogen fertilizer, a seasonal nitrogen fertilizer uh, applied in addition to that. Now, in this particular study, we've tried to maintain an optimum level uh, phosphorus, potassium, and the micronutrients on this study. So the primary response we believe that we're seeing on the compost in terms of nutrition is a nitrogen response. Now there may be some other physical problems or physical uh, influences there as well, but uh, we think it's primarily a nitrogen at this point. Compost also produce potatoes with higher specific gravity and therefore greater value for processing. The processor likes to process potatoes that have a high dry matter content so that they don't have to worry about or process the water that's in the tuber. Now the compost also give us a yield response in terms of tuber, uh, tuber yield, but it, it had no effect and did not decrease the specific gravity of the tubers. In this particular case, uh, we made an estimate that uh, in terms of the return to the grower here, uh, just based on, on Pacific Gravity improvement alone, it was worth $100 an acre. In the following year, compost and fertilizer each improved the yield of malting barley, but unlike chemical nitrogen fertilizer, compost did not reduce the crop quality. The California Integrated Waste Management Board sponsored several demonstration and research projects investigating agricultural uses of yard trimmings compost. Harry Andrus, a farm advisor with the University of California Extension System, describes the project concerning compost effects on peach production. Well, we compared uh, this composted green material with ammonium nitrate, with manure, with composted manure, as well as with um, a pelletized chicken manure. We found that there was no difference in the yield among any of these treatments. There was no difference in the storage quality among these. We also had a flavor, um, a test panel, if you like, where we took fruit from the ammonium nitrate treatment, the composted uh, green, uh, green material, as well as manure, took them to grocery stores and had a uh, professional taste test panelist uh, perform an operation on consumers, and they could find no difference between the flavor components uh, of this fruit. So it looks like this material from uh, yard trimmings is going to be an acceptable and, and uh, worthwhile application uh, material if growers should choose to use it. Another California project used compost as a primary component on a sustainable vegetable production system. 
One of the other uh, projects that I'm involved in, sustainable farming system projects, has been using compost on our organic and low input systems for approximately 10 years now. And what we've learned in those sets of trials is that uh, we don't need as much nitrogen as we would if we were using conventional fertilizers. But secondly, we've increased the organic matter tremendously. Uh, well, it was around 0.7 and we've got it up to about 1% now, which is pretty substantial for California conditions, dry during the summer as we are, and the materials oxidize very rapidly. And so we've increased organic matter. We've uh, increased the total uh, amount of uh, microorganisms in that soil sufficiently now to where there's no one population that's become dominant. And so in some ways, We've uh, avoided a lot of our disease problems by, I'm not certain if it's just the organic matter from the compost, but we have reduced our disease problems. We've increased the amount of free living nematodes which help cycle all these. So we've actually increased our food web, our microbial food web in those particular soils to where now we're starting to get excellent yields at a much less uh, or much reduced rate of compost additions. Whereas we were adding uh, 10 to 15 tons initially, now we're down to 5 tons, 4 tons uh, per year and achieving full yields now. David Granistein with Washington State University has been studying the effects of compost application in apple orchards for several years. For the past 4 or 5 years I've been working with orchardists here in uh, central Washington testing various composts in their orchard. We looked at uh, compost application on about 12 different sites and typically would follow that application or multiple applications over three years at a given location. We had a couple different goals we were, we were trying to achieve. One was to see whether, in fact, the reports that growers were giving us of improved growth from compost could be documented when we were out there measuring actual results. We also were quite interested in whether compost could play a positive role in suppressing the apple replant disease. Typically we would measure tree growth, uh, most commonly the trunk cross-sectional area and the growth of the, the leaders. We also measured leaf nitrogen in some of the studies and in a few cases we looked at soil moisture. On some of the trees that were bearing we also measured yield and fruit size. Over the past several years we have taken a lot of measurements in these different orchards and if we were to to make one conclusion, it's that there has been no consistent response to, to the compost applications in orchards. In some of the individual orchards in a given year, we were able to measure a significant growth response to compost. But often we might see that in one year and not the other two years. So inconsistency of results is probably the most notable uh, factor. On the flip side, there have really been no negatives either. And so if one looks at the compost application as a way to enhance organic matter content in the soil, it's a longer term investment which we may not see the benefit of in the short term of our study. Now we'd like to take a closer look at the ways that compost affects agricultural soils and crop production. We are fortunate to have with us in the studio four agricultural professionals with a great deal of expertise and experience with compost. Dan Sullivan is an extension and research soil scientist with Oregon State University. Dan is a specialist in agricultural use of organic materials, such as compost, and he is a member of the Surwa project team. John Paul is a soil scientist with Transform Compost Systems Limited, a compost technology company in Abbotsford, British Columbia. John has seven years of experience with compost and composting as a waste management scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Mark Buchanan is an independent soil scientist and consultant in Santa Cruz, California. Mark has conducted numerous projects covering compost use in agriculture, from research to farm application. And Marcy Grebus is extension plant pathologist at the University of California, Riverside. Marcy is well known for her work on the disease suppressive effects of compost. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Dan, I'd like to start off uh, with a question for you based on uh, some of the comments we've heard in our video clips, uh, it seems that a lot of the farmers are depending on compost for fertility. Is compost a good fertilizer? Well, I would primarily like to talk about the uh, nitrogen that is in compost, since that's the nutrient that is often required in the greatest quantity 
to produce a crop. And basically there's three questions you want to ask yourself about compost and nitrogen. The first is, how much nitrogen does your compost have? And you can determine that by using an, an analysis, a laboratory analysis. Most composts contain, say, 1 to 3 percent total nitrogen, so there's a 300 percent difference depending on which material you're, you're uh, talking about. Secondly, the big question people have is the analysis is fairly easy to do, but the tough question is how fast does that slow-release nitrogen get released? And so uh, this depends on feedstocks, how mature the compost is, and I'll be talking more about that later in the program. And then finally, if you know your compost, you need to match that up with your crop needs. Each crop will have its own requirements as to how much nitrogen it needs and when it needs it, needs it to be present. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Um, many of the comments were specifically, in the videos, were specifically related to nitrogen amounts in compost. I'm curious to know, are there, uh, uh, is nitrogen the main nutrient that compost provides? Mark, you have some experience with nutrients in compost. Um, and I want to follow up a little bit with what uh, Dan said and talk a little bit about nitrogen, and then I want to echo what uh, Ralph and some of the other um, <coughs> video speakers have talked about in terms of phosphorus and, and potassium as well. Um, some of the work I've been involved in, uh, we found that there, there can be a, an important interaction between a conventional nitrogen source or, or even a, an additional organic nitrogen source and the material too, depending upon, uh, let's start with the feedstocks or the pedigree of the material and also the degree of processing. Um, I've found in some work that actually we were able to enhance the use efficiency by a vegetable crop of the applied nitrogen fertilizer, a conventional nitrogen fertilizer, um, when the compost was a little bit immature so that there was continued digestion. There was a little bit of what we call immobilization or uh, let's just say tie up of that nitrogen and actually what we got was in a sense, at least from the data, was a slow release kind of characteristic out of the material. And we also in, a, in some work have noticed this with yard trimmings composts also that they tend to have a little bit less of a nitrogen mineralization component or nitrogen release component. They actually, in a sense, tie up a little bit of it, but in a sense don't tie it up in a manner that uh, ends up with a deficiency or an impact on that crop. Um, certainly, uh, we've seen um, some phosphorus increases, just as we might expect from um, manure sources as well. The one thing that I've noticed in general with, the, with phosphorus uh, assays of soil and, and crop uptake is we see a more early response to phosphorus uptake in certain vegetable crops. Um, that availability seems to, in the soil, we can test that and see that over the next following year or so that there is still a residual impact on phosphorus. Um, certainly with potassium, um, particularly with composts that either come from manure sources or again plant residues, yard trimmings, et cetera, and so on, we tend to have a high uh, potassium level if there's no leaching that goes on during the material, uh, during the materials processing. And uh, again, we've seen uh, significant impacts on, uh, again, statistically significant impacts on phosphorus uptake early, and then also significant long-lived impacts on uh, availability in the soil, particularly in clay or soils with a cation exchange capacity that allows that potassium to be retained. And then finally, I've also seen in some limited cases um, some improved zinc nutrition as well from various composts. Great. So certainly there are a lot of other nutrients available in compost yes. in addition to nitrogen uh, availability. Uh, John, uh, many of the growers spoke about the benefits of compost to the soil, soil biology, tilth. Uh, how important is this to the grower? Well, Eric, in, in answering this question, I'm going to describe what soil is. I'm going to review what we're asking our soils to do in agriculture, and then I'll discuss how compost benefits the soil. If we look at a bit of soil, what is it? It consists of 90 to 100 uh, percent bits of rock, <clears throat> and these are in clay, silt, and sand size fractions. It contains 0 to 10 percent uh, organic matter, and that provides some of the glue that holds the, the bits of rock together. And what we don't see is that it's this little bit of soil is home to a few billion bacteria and fungi. And um, this is really the exciting stuff in, in the soil that release the nutrients, provide the, the glue in the organic matter that holds the soil together. And um, it's also home to larger organisms like beetles, springtails, and, and other critters that um, help decompose organic matter. 
So what are we asking this bit of soil to do? Well, we're asking it to be a good root, rooting media. Uh, we want the roots to go through easy. We want the, the, it to hold the plants. It has to hold water. It has to release the water to, to the plants. Can't hold it too tightly. It has to provide nutrients to plants, particularly uh, micronutrients. It has to hold the nutrients that we add in, um, in fertilizer. It has to have a stable pH. So for example, when we add nitrogen fertilizers, typically our pHs go down. Well, we'd like the soil to stabilize this pH. And we want the soil to be friable. We want it to break apart uh, so that the roots can to penetrate through it. But we also want the soil to stay together because we don't want this soil washing down into the rivers and oceans. So it's, it's a pretty tall order for a soil. And so what is it that, that does most of this for the soil? It's the organic matter. So what are we doing when we are adding uh, compost to soil? We're, we're adding stable organic matter. So what happens then uh, when we add compost to soil? We can expect a decrease in bulk density, which means that we have a better rooting media. The roots are, find an easier path to go through the soil. Uh, we increase the water holding capacity, So we and some of the um, Producers have observed this in the field as well. Uh, less irrigation required. Uh, we're providing both macro and micronutrients to plants. And, and we are doing the buffering of the pH. Uh, but the most exciting thing that, that's really happening is, is we're feeding the few billion bacteria that are in this little bit of, of uh, soil. And they do the exciting stuff. They release uh, macro and micronutrients. They secrete the glues that hold the soil together. They also secrete substances that release nutrients from the mineral bits of soil that are in here. So it's, there is a lot of uh, positive physical and biological aspects to, um, to adding compost to soil. Thanks. So it sounds like, certainly like compost is, is really adding to the soil health in general in terms of that biology. Well, on the, the flip side of the coin in terms of, of the, some of those biological uh, mechanisms, I guess there's some growing interest in the use of compost as uh, a, a way to suppress plant diseases. And Marcy, I, I would be interested in, to know, does compost truly help plants resist disease? And if so, how does that work? Well, Eric, um, yes, it's possible. We've, we found in the laboratory. But as a plant pathologist, we, consider, we don't consider disease suppression as disease suppression, we consider each specific disease, each specific pathogen that causes the disease in plant system. And we found that there are a number of um, different means in which the microorganisms that you're introducing in compost can interact with the pathogens and uh, result in less disease problem. And you can kind of break down these microbial um, mechanisms into four categories. The first is just a general competition. Compost introduces a wide variety of microorganisms that may not already be present that just compete with the uh, pathogens for space and other uh, food nutrients. One of the uh, mechanisms would be, say, siderophores, which sequester iron and make it available to certain microorganisms but not others, such as pathogens. Another mechanism would be antagonism or microbiostasis, in which beneficial microbes uh, produce compounds that such as antibiotics that kind of deactivate others, sort of put them into stasis. Doesn't necessarily kill them, but they're inactivated, so they, they don't cause a problem. Hyperparasitism is a mechanism in which one parasite parasitizes or consumes another for its food source. And a number of microorganisms have been found that actually colonize pathogens and consume them. So they're, they're parasites of the plant parasites. And uh, the fourth mechanism that we've looked at is um, called systemic acquired resistance, or abbreviated SAR, and some people call it induced resistance, in which certain microorganisms that can be found in composts um, interact with a plant root and uh, produce a signal molecule that tells the plant to behave in a manner as though or resistant to um, a, a pathogen or disease-causing organism present. So they can cause the plants, rather than attacking the pathogen, to become resistant. And so that's, that's how we kind of break down how the microorganisms in a compost system may interact with the present pathogens to help plants uh, fight off disease. Well, great. Well, thank you.
thank you all for uh, sharing with us additional information about the benefits of compost in terms of soil biology and nutrient levels and disease suppression. Uh, we will be talking with the panel uh, later on in the program and they will have opportunities to address your questions. Uh, in spite of somewhat inconsistent benefits and occasional negative aspects that result from compost use, you probably can sense now uh, what I would call an underlying confidence among many of the compost users and researchers about the rewards of agricultural uses of compost. Well, what we'd like to do now is uh, we've reached the midpoint of our program and we'd like to take a short break to allow us all a little time to stretch and relax. We will resume our program in about eight minutes. Remember, if you have questions, please phone, fax, or email them to us even during the break. And we'll see you in about eight minutes.